since we're a bilingual church, we're always looking for words that are the same thing in both languages. If you find any, please send it to us. Maybe something we haven't seen, but we, we love it when something is in both and it's the same. I love radar. It's the same in English and Spanish, forwards, backwards, it's all the same. I, I love that, nice and symmetric. One of the other words is simple. Simple. And so the whole month of September, we're going to focus on this idea of simple. You know, in an ever more complex world that we live in, everybody is looking for simple. In fact, simple sells. If you watch your advertisement, Apple, for example, Apple wants everything to be simple, user-friendly, and once if you've got your iPhone or you've got your iPad or your iPad mini or your iPad mini with retina display or your iPad Air or what, they just want it all to be simple and everything work together. That, that sells, and that's why they do it. But it, it's not just in computing, because you, you go to the other extreme, let's say pizza. Here's Papa John's, you know. What's Papa John's? Just fresh ingredients. It's, it's that simple. You, fresh ingredients, better ingredients make better pizza. That's the idea. Just, just trying to make everything simple for us, whether it's Southwest Airlines and, you know, you, you don't pay for the bag, you just get in line, forget all the boarding pass and all, just get in line like cattle and we'll get you on. It's simple, but it works and it sells. Because every day life gets more and more complicated and we really, really long for simple. Now let's define simple though. Because simple can mean kind of like not too smart and that's not what we're talking about here. Simple is what we will describe as easy to understand, easy to deal with, or use. In other words, everything totally opposite from government. We got that? <laughs> just, just, just the way life is. Simple, not elaborate, not artificial, uh, not ornate, not necessarily luxurious, unaffected, unassuming, modest, not complicated, not complex. We like simple. Now, with that said, there's a problem with this. And the problem is this. Human beings tend to make things complicated. There's just something in us that we take simplicity and we make it complicated. It happens all the time. When you go back in, in Jesus' days, the religious leaders of their day had taken the words of God in the Old Testament and they had taken them and made them extremely complicated. You have three numbers up here. 613 is the number of Hebrew letters in the Ten Commandments. Now, don't go back to your Bible and count the letters because you don't have it in Hebrew, okay? Let's help you out with that one. Start. But because there were 613 individual Hebrew letters in the Ten Commandments, they went through the whole Pentateuch, the books of, of Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and took out from the laws of, that God had given them picked out 613 laws and said, this is what God wants us to do. But divided them up into two groups. One group was 248. Now, the 248 were the things that we were supposed to do, okay? Now, they picked 248 because according to their understanding of human body, there were 248 body parts in a human being. So they picked out 248, and then there were 365 negative. These are things that you don't do. 
Anybody want to guess why they picked 365? One for each day of the year. Okay, so, and if you add 365 and 248, you get 613. And then they divided these up into smaller groups. And they categorized them on these are definite things that you do, and these are kind of optional. And then they started putting them in order of which one is more important. And they would sit around, these, these great people who had studied, they would sit around and discuss and argue about the order in which they had put them. You're going, really? Yeah. That's kind of complicated to me. Jesus comes on the scene. And they ask Jesus... Which do you think, or which do you say is the greatest of the commands, right? They're trying to get his order. And he says, here it is. First of all, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And the second one is the same. Love your neighbor as yourself. And here is the big thing. This summarizes all of the law and all of the prophets. Take your 613 extremely complicated rules, boil it down to two, this is what you need to do. Well, you know, when you boil it down to two, it kind of took away their whole purpose for being which was to make things complicated and to make things complicated on top of everybody else and discuss all the complications. But Jesus came about and he said, we're going to make this very simple. Because Jesus was very simple. That was revolutionary in his time. May I just say, we need to go back, way back to the way of Jesus. Jesus. Think in this context, this, this, all these laws, 613, and, and as one guy said the other day, and the 614th is just, don't forget any of the 613 that I've given you. Here, here it is. Then Jesus said, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy, carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle at heart and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. He said, religion has been piling things on you, complicated things, and I am telling you, no, come to me if you want to find rest. He says, my yoke, the burden that I put on you, it's easy to bear. The burden is light. Have you ever felt like Living the Christian life is just so hard. I mean, God has just put so much on me. Man, I can't handle this. Let me help you out. God didn't do that. Now, you may have gotten loaded up on a bunch of stuff. You may be trying to carry a bunch of stuff that God never intended for you to carry. Jesus said, my burden is light. The yoke, the, the, the work that I have, the things that we do, it is easy to bear. Maybe, just maybe, before you carried that issue, you forgot to ask Jesus if you were supposed to carry it. Maybe you just loaded yourself up on stuff and then came to Jesus and going, God, help me, I'm dying here. Instead of saying, should I pick that up? Is that for me? 
The world in which we live in is, wow, really, really, really complicated. Let me help you with a little deal for November. No candidate from either party, red, blue, or purple, is going to solve the issues. Not going to happen. You are not going to solve all the issues. There is no way I can solve all the issues that I encounter every day. I, I'll be honest with you. Just pulling up to a street corner and trying to figure out how to help that person that says, I'm just trying to survive. I don't have a solution for every one of the people I run into every day. I know this is going to make me look like a really bad pastor. There is no way I can handle all your burdens. There's just no way. I have people say every now and then, Russell, how do you handle all the burdens of the people in the congregation? I don't. <laughs> there is simply no way. Every time I hear of an issue, every time somebody comes with a burden, every time somebody comes with a pain, I have to ask Jesus, is this something I'm supposed to jump in and do something? Or is this something I'm just supposed to take to you and you've got someone else that's going to help? Because there is no way I can carry it. I'm going to be honest. My wife tries a lot harder than I do. She'll cry with everybody that comes by. She, I mean, if you're hurting, you don't know this, but the drive home on church on Sunday is not always fun. Did you see so-and-so? Yeah, they're hurting and I'm going, put it down. Put it down. You know? Or I put on frozen, let it go, let it go. But we won't go there. <laughs> there is no way to do it. Mothers, you cannot carry all those things. You can't do that. Dads, I know you think everybody thinks that you, I know you can't. But if every one of us will simply go to Jesus and say, Jesus, is there something you want me to do here today? Is there something you want me to do with this situation right now? He will tell you yes or no. That is the way of Jesus. When the church began, church was not complicated, it was simple. When you go to Acts chapter 2 and verse 42, it says all the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. Wow! Where's Awana's? I don't know. Where was Kid Zone? I don't know. Where was Youth? I don't know. But you know what? The Bible says that doing these simple things, they filled Jerusalem with their teaching. In fact, by the end of chapter 5, which is just a few months down the line, it says, and every day in the temple and from house to house, they continued to teach and preach this message. Jesus is the Messiah. That was it. The message was Jesus. The solution to every issue was Jesus. We need to follow the way of Jesus. We need to do things the way Jesus said to do them. And let me tell you something. That is still the answer today. Jesus. It was simple. There's a book that came out a few years ago. And it's entitled Simple Church. You're going, did you get that? Oh, heck yeah. 
Simple Church. It was written by Tom Rainer and a guy named Eric Geiger. And one of them was a pastor at a church down here in the south part of town. He was on the pastoral staff. So a lot of the examples he uses are Miami examples. And believe me, Miami examples are different than Nebraska examples, okay? There's just a different flavor to it all. And so they're sharing, and this is what he, they said. It said, a simple church is a congregation designed around a straightforward and strategic process that moves people through the stages of spiritual growth. It continues on. To have a simple church, you must design a simple discipleship process. The process must be clear. It must move people toward maturity. It must be integrated fully into your church and you must get rid of the clutter around it. Imagine a church where you as a leader, this was written to pastors, can articulate clearly how someone moves from being a new Christian to become a mature follower of Christ. Imagine that your church is no longer just busy, but is alive with ministries and activities that make a difference. Such is the simple church revolution. Welcome to the journey. This, what we're going to be talking about here in September, this series is designed to share with you the simple process that we have to move people from here just getting to know Jesus, who he is, what he's done, move them through the process to here where then God can use them any way he wants. Whether it's right there at their work and they're equipped to do it or if it's taking them around the world and doing it there. Doesn't matter. Doesn't, the title's not important. It's just taking them from, from brand new here, I want to know who Jesus is from here to there so that we all know what the process is. So we can all look at this and go, first of all, where am I in this process? Are you here? Are you here? Are you here? Or are you here? And all this side over here is going, man, we're the mature ones in this crowd. I can see this already. So you're trying to see where do we go along the way. We want you to be able to know and help someone else do that. Here we go. Ready? We do not have a discipleship program. We have a model that guides us through the process of making disciples. You're going, I could never go to a church that doesn't have a discipleship program. Let me, let me explain. We don't have a program. What is a program? A program is simply this. If you take classes A, B, and C, or you complete books X, Y, Z, at the end of it all, you receive a certificate of discipleship. Question, does going through a series of books or classes make you a follower of Christ? No, let, let me put it another way. Because you went first grade, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, ninth grade, tenth grade, eleventh grade, twelfth grade, diploma, are you ready to face life? No. You got the diploma. You got the yay, 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 I did it. Uh, uh, no. No, not, not quite. Okay, so let's keep going. So we get first year college, second year college. Hey, are we ready? No. Third year, fourth year. Am I ready? How many of you have that one and go, oh gosh, I'm still not ready? <laughs> and so, so now you go, you go from BS to the MS and you got more of the same. And then you get the PhD and it's piled high and deep and you're still not ready. What are we saying? 
We're saying that just finishing a list of requirements does not necessarily make you mature, ready, responsible, productive in society, right? If you ever run into someone that only got a sixth grade education, but you really wish your kids were like them because of who they turned out to be in life? Well, it's not that you're just wanting them to get a sixth grade education. It's there are these intangibles. There's these being responsible. There are these, all of these things that go along that, that really are characteristics of someone who you can trust, who you can follow, who you can depend on, who you can give the task to that is more important than whether or not they've earned the degrees along the way. Would you agree to that? Okay, so there's a difference between a program and a model. A model is here are the stages, here are the marks, here are the things that we look at in a growing disciple. These are things that growing disciples do, and these are things that they don't do. These are behavior issues. These are character traits in someone who is following Christ. That is a model. We don't have a program, but we do have a model. But then you have a third component, and it's called the resources. Let me tell you something. Resources change all the time. We used to, back, oh gosh, 20 years ago, we had this wonderful little book. It's called The Arrival Kit. How many of you did The Arrival Kit? Oh, yeah. Anybody seen one of those recently? What, the one you used that you kept for 20 years? Good girl. It's hard to find arrival kits anymore. And, and I hear people say all the time, you know, I don't, think, I don't think I've been discipled because I saw they had an arrival kit. Nobody gave me an arrival kit. Well, that's cute, but that's not the point. There, the books come in, books go out, all kind of resources. It's not the book. It's a resource to help you. Let me ask you a question. What book did Jesus use? He didn't go to Lifeway Christian. He, he didn't have. They didn't even have the New Testament yet. Jesus took his disciples out and said, you see this vineyard here? Let me teach you something. You see that guy out there throwing seed? Let's talk about the seed. Let me tell you what happens. Resources change. I've seen people that can't read and write. How do you disciple someone that can't read and write? There's other ways of learning. There's entire groups of people that don't have the Bible written out, and yet they, they do storytelling, and they divided the Bible, and they know more of the Bible than probably you or I do because they've been taught, and they've put it in their life, and they're obeying it. I love it when people ask me, which Bible should I buy? Which is the best Bible? Let me tell you which the best Bible is. Ready to write this one down? The one you understand and the one you obey. That's the best Bible. Because if you don't understand it, it didn't do you any good. And if you don't obey it, I don't care what it is. It does you no good. So we simply have to get down and say, okay, what is the model? What are we going to follow to take people from here all the way to there? We're going to follow the life of who? Three people, remember. We're going to follow the life of Peter. Why? Because Peter is one of those guys in the Bible that we see him from the time he first met Jesus... All the way to, well, to where he was effectively used by God in a tremendous way. And I want you to know, 
The Peter that wrote 1st and 2nd Peter is a different guy than left all the nets to follow Jesus. Dietrich Bonhoeffer in his book, The Cost of Discipleship, made this statement. On two separate occasions, Peter received the call, follow me. It was the first and last words Jesus spoke to his disciple. A whole life lies between these two calls. Between the two calls lay a whole life of discipleship in the following of Christ. We have taken these, this, this whole life and we've narrowed it down to four words that you're going to begin hearing a lot of. And here are the four words. Word number one is connect. Connect. Word number two is know. Word number three is care. And one, word number four is go. Connect, know, care, and go. Here it is. Here's the motto. Connect. No. Care. And go. That's it. Who's supposed to go? Try this again. Who's supposed to go? Everybody. Everybody. Everybody's supposed to go. I don't want to go. It's not a matter of did you got to go to the other side of the world. It's that you got to go wherever you are. You got to go somewhere else. You, you, you got to be on one side of the room. You got to go to the person on the other side of the room. If you're on one side of town, you got to be willing to go to the other side of town. If you're on one side of the street, go to the other side of the street. But you got to get beyond yourself and go to others if God is going to use you. Jesus came all the way from heaven to earth. He expects us to at least go a little ways. But how do you get from here, from there to here? Well, you start off in stage one. And stage one, again, the key word is connect. But this stage, we gave it a name a long time ago, and it's a, it's a stage of new relationships. New relationships with Jesus and with others who are also followers of Jesus. When... When Jesus first encountered Peter, he was fishing. He was doing what he knew how to do. And Jesus came to him after a little miracle of the, the multi, many fish that he caught and everything. He said, follow me. He didn't say, sign up for my seminary. He didn't say, I want you to obey everything I tell you. He didn't say, believe that I am the son of God. What did he say? Follow me. Follow me. Here's an interesting thing. Peter said, okay. And he left the nets all behind. And he followed him. What did he do? He did a lot of looking. He just kind of watched Jesus. He watched Jesus when people came and attacked him. I'm sure Peter is going, oh, watch. He's going to call down the angels, going to deck them dudes right now. And he didn't. And he was just kind in his words. And he, and he threw questions out and, and made them think. And he, and he did all this, and he's just watching him. And then one day he says, okay, all these people, 5,000 men plus women and children, they're hungry. Go get them something to eat. And they're going, we don't have money. And, and somebody finally finds this little boy that has five loaves of bread and two fish and says, here it is. And Jesus says, okay, you sit them down in groups of 50 and 100. And, and okay, guys, they're following me. I want you to take these baskets and I want you to take the fish and the bread out to the guys. And I'm betting Peter's going, this is going to run out fast. I'm going to be the first one to get my basket just in case it's not enough, you know. And so he gets his out and he starts going and he hands out an amazingly, his 58 from five and two 
and he goes back and there's more and he kept going back and forth to 50 and 100 and everybody's doing this and what lesson did he learn? No matter what the odds are, if I keep going back to Jesus, he's always got enough for whatever the situation is. That's a big lesson. That's a big lesson. The all-sufficiency of Jesus, and it wasn't in some big theological book and systematic theology and all. No, no, it was simply going back to Jesus for all he needed and come back. He watched him. He followed him. I'm sure he was curious, and, and in those conversations, he, he would ask some things. And we don't not even privy to the conversations, but, but he was trying to figure out and following and asking him. Let me tell you something. The first thing you need to know when you're right here, you need to know Jesus. You need to know who he is. You need to know what he is all about. You need to connect with Jesus. Russell. <laughs> How am I going to connect with someone who hasn't been here for over 2,000 years? How am I going to do that? Well, let me help you. Let me give you some things. Number one, read the Gospels. What are the Gospels? The first four books of the New Testament are Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. If you've got a Bible... You go to, to about two-thirds of the way through, divides the old from the new, and when you get there, the first four books, which is about this much, that's the Gospels. That's not too much, is it? And, and, and if you say, well, I don't have a Bible, if you go to the back and say, hey, I, I, I would like a New Testament or, or something, I think on the back we even have the Gospel of John. That's just one of these four. And you can read the life of Christ in that and, and begin to know who Jesus was, who Jesus said he was. You read the Gospels. Now, if you haven't bought a Bible yet, when you buy your Bible, if you can, find one that's got red letters. Why do you want one with red letters? Because Jesus wrote with red ink? No. Why do we want red letters? Those are the actual words of Jesus. It's not what others said he said. These were actually his words. So, so let's find out exactly what he said about an issue. At least know the difference. Now, the whole Bible is God's word. But if we want to know Jesus in particular and we get to know what the red letters say, it will really help us. Now let me give you a third one. Understand or get to understand the metaphors of Jesus. And you're going, oh, see, we just left simple. We went back to English class and I slept through all of English class and I didn't get that metaphor thing. Let me help you. Jesus said, I am the vine. You are the branches. Now, what does that mean? Well, where are we going to find vines and branches? We're going to find grapes. You're going, I can't afford to go to Sonoma Valley, California to do this. Well, then go to Central Florida or, or Google. There's a concept. Google. And you'll see that vine is, is the main piece. Branches are the little things that come off, and then the grapes are what grow off that. And so all of a sudden, Jesus says, look, I'm the main thing. You don't get any grapes without it coming out of here because these little branches all by themselves, they can't do anything. And what did Jesus say? Without me, you can do what? Nothing. Nothing. So as you read and you begin to understand what this is, all of a sudden it hits you. The single most important thing I have to do in life, the single most important thing I have to do every day is stay connected to the vine because without him, I can do how much? 
nothing. You want to know why life gets heavy? Because we're going around trying to do things on our own, and Jesus says without him, we can do nothing, and yet we're trying to do it without him, and it's really heavy. And when it's all said and done, it ends up as nothing. It's taken me 60 years, but I finally figured this out. Whatever time I need to get going in life, I got to back it up an hour and a half or two so that I have time to stay connected to the vine. Now, if you've known me for a long time, I was a night person. My creative juices started flowing about 10 o'clock at night. I mean, 9 o'clock, it was like I'm waking up. I would write. I would translate. I would do all kinds of stuff late at night till 2 or 3. How many of you are like that? You're going, yeah, that's my time, okay? My wife was always the early morning, and that's because she was a mama and had kids and all that stuff, but I was the late night one. And I started figuring out, Lord, I, I, I really need your help because I figured out my day goes better if I stop first and just spend some time with you. You're going, Russell, you're the pastor. You should have known that. I know, but listen to me. It's not just studying. It's, it's, it's connecting time. Connecting time is different than study time. And so I remember a couple of years ago, I said, Lord, I need your help. I need you to wake me up earlier. Let me tell you something. That alarm clock does not go out when FP&L fails. When Jesus wakes you up, he will get you with a cramp or with something, but you will get up. <laughs> you will wake up. All of a sudden, I'm this early morning riser dude, and my wife goes, who is he? I have no idea. Now, do not text me after 8 o'clock because you ain't getting an answer because it's gone somewhere in another room. I don't even put it close to me. But, but it, it's amazing how much simpler life is simply because I've gotten this metaphor. He's the vine. I'm the branch. I've got to go back to that every minute of every day. You get the other, I am the light of the world. I am the bread of life. I am the living water. All of these things you begin to understand. You begin to know Jesus at that level. And then all of a sudden, life becomes much simpler. I was talking with someone the other day. And we were talking about a a very difficult situation, and I said, you know, I'm finding that life is a lot simpler than it used to be, and they're going, what? This world is crazy. I said, yeah, the world is crazy. But my life is simpler because now, if I just take it to Jesus, say, do I do this or not? He says, yes or no. Do I carry this or no? If he says no, drop it like a pancake, man. Just only take on because his burden is what? Light. You have to connect with Jesus. But here's the next thing. When Peter began following Jesus, guess what? He began hanging around other guys that were following Jesus. And they were weird from his perspective. You got Matthew over here. And what was Matthew? Matthew was a tax collector. He was a traitor to, the, to everyone. And, 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 and Peter's like, what? I got to hang around with this guy? I'm following Jesus, and now he's following Jesus, so he and I are, con oh, man. And you got that other guy named Simon, same name, except Simon was what? He was a terrorist. 
You're going, I didn't know that. You got to read your Bible. He was. They literally, he was a zealot. And a zealot was what we would call a terrorist. And, and, and he was connected to the same. And then there was that Judas dude. And he was always after the money. And he was connected with all these other people. And he's going, you know, I don't know. If I want to be, look around you. There's some weird people in this room. <laughs> this is just be. There's people here that you wouldn't pick to go on vacation with. And yet you were at Lake Placid going, yay! <laughs> one, of the, one of the neatest things about retreats for me is see who actually ends up hanging out with who. And sometimes I go in, what do they have in common? What do they possibly have in common? And you know, the only thing most people have in common in these situations is that they're part of the same forever family. There's a word you're going to learn here. You begin to connect with your forever family. Russell, why do you call them your forever family? Those weird people you just saw that, that are following Jesus too, they're in church, you're going to spend eternity with them. <laughs> so you better figure out how to work it out now. You're going, no, I'm going to be on one side of heaven, they're going to be on the other side of heaven. No, it doesn't work that way. It's not going to work that way. Connect with your forever family. When you begin connecting with your forever family, you discover that what we have in common in Christ, and you fill out the rest of it, is greater than any other factor in life. I guarantee you, I am close to many of you here today, closer than any of my cousins. You're going, what kind of family you got? They're in Oklahoma. I haven't seen them in years. I cannot imagine them getting any better in some cases. When your cousin marries two women and they both have the same name, this is weird at family reunions. I just want you to know that. And, and things, all of a sudden, even if they're in the same town, all of a sudden, you have more in common because you have Jesus in common than other things. The, the things you used to do, you don't do them anymore. Not because church told you not to. You just, there's something inside you goes, why are you doing that? Why are you saying that? The more you, you get connected to Jesus and, he, and he's the vine, I mean, the fruit that, that used to come out of you doesn't, come out that same way. I love it when somebody comes up to me and it happens from time to time and they say, you know, I was around some old friends and, and the stuff they used to do it, that I used to do it, I don't know. It just, it just doesn't seem right anymore. And I love it when they had this. And I never heard you preach against that. You know why? Because it's not a matter of my preaching against it. It's the Jesus that's inside of us all of a sudden begins changing us from the inside. And all of a sudden things are different. All of a sudden things just aren't the same. All of a sudden those that have Jesus we have more in common with than others that we used to be close to but they don't have Jesus anymore. We begin to discover the power of the one and others. You go, what are you talking about? In, in the early church, for the first time ever, people were getting together that never had been together in society before. Jews and Gentiles. Before when Gentile, 
the shadow of a Gentile fell on a Jew, he would go home and change clothes. And now in the church, in Christ, they're all together. They're eating at the same table. Many times, the slave and the owner were in the same church. And there was nothing in society where they were together as equals. You start putting all these different elements of society together in one place, guess what? There were going to be issues. I have people ask me sometimes, they go, how do you pastor a church with people from so many different countries? How do you do that? I said, it's easy. You just make fun of everybody. <laughs> Sounded like a solution to me. But, but it's amazing. So because they were putting all these people together from all these different segments of society... They were having problems, so now the apostles were writing, Peter and Paul and John and James, all of these people were writing, and they would say, now you need to do this one to another. You need to do this one to another. You don't need to do this one to another. You need to do this one to another. This is what we call the one another's. In your bulletin, you've got a, a cute little gray card. Pull it out, please. Look at this card. This card is the most powerful card in the world. You're going, you're crazy. No, no, literally. There is not a problem between two people that cannot be resolved if both of them will do what's on this card. Husbands and wives. You got an issue. How many husbands and wives admit that occasionally there are issues that come up? Raise your hand. Hi, hi. The others live in Egypt. It's called denial. <laughs> <clears throat> when you have an issue, stop, hand out the little gray cards, one to each, and you sit there and you read through the card, and here's your prayer. God, show me what I need to do. See, now some of you had this card before. But here's what you did. I'm going to read on this till I found what that sorry other one needs to do. <laughs> it's not what the other one needs to do. It's what you need to do, okay? You read this and ask the Lord, Lord, show me what I need to do, and then obey. Russell, I just need professional counseling. Okay, bring me your $100 an hour, <laughs> give me the $100, and I will give you a fresh gray card. <laughs> Because I guarantee you the answer is here. It really is. Brother and sister, the answer is here. So many issues that separate people could be solved if they simply read and obeyed what's on this card. Over 30 years now, I've been trying to find a problem that isn't solved by this. Haven't found one yet. You're going, well, you haven't heard mine. Bring me your $100 and we'll find out. <laughs> Just kidding. But this is it. The power of the one another's. When things happen, you choose to react in one of two ways. In the flesh or in the spirit? Most of the times our issues happen because we react in the flesh. In our pride. 
just, just take pride out of the equation and it's amazing how many issues can be solved. Just pride. Just pride. Some of you are thinking, yeah, yeah. And you can. And all of these things we can begin to learn here. Right here. Getting to know Jesus. Connect with him. Begin to connect with others and figure out how to make that connection work. It works. It happens right there. Russell, what are some resources we have? Let, let me help you with resources, okay? At this stage in life, the number one resource you need is a Bible and a running partner, a mentor, someone to help you along. It always helps when you have somebody with you. This morning I was reading in Proverbs 26, and I'm reading two verses, and one verse says one thing, and the next verse seems to say exactly the opposite from that. And I'm going, okay, whoa, 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 whoa. Something, I'm not reading this right. So, so who do you call? Well, I have other resources on my phone. So I went looking to other places until I found the solution. I, I, I see, oh, now I understand. It always helps to have someone that's a little further along in the process than you are to help you out. We were never intended to live alone. We were never intended to grow alone. We were never intended to have children and drop them off outside and say, see you later. No. They, they need care. They need help. They need someone else along the side. The same thing it is with spiritual children. They need help. And it's always good to have a Bible and a running partner. Second thing, a life group. I cannot stress enough the importance of having someone around you. On on. Friday night, the young people, we were here talking, and, and Jan asked the question, why, why would you want to have a life group? And, and, and I thought their answers were fabulous. I would call them out right now, but I'll be nice, even though they said if I called them by name, it would make them feel more engaged. So I could do that, Hermit, but I want. So we'll just work it out that way. Just want you to feel engaged and part of the conversation. But... In a small group, in a life group, you, you kind of have a built-in cheering section and help. But Russell, the group of people I was with are just not perfect. Let me help you out. <laughs> You're not either. They were perfect and then you showed up. <laughs> Nobody's perfect. I have not been to a perfect group. Never. But I've been to some really good groups that blessed my heart and taught me things and, and allowed others to grow and help people grow. And did they? Because we're made up of imperfect people. And yet, God uses them to, to help us along to grow, to, to put into practice, to connect with Jesus, and to connect with one another. We need life groups. We also have some books. Life in the Vineyard and Walking with Jesus. What do these two things have in common? What do these two things have in common? Yami, what do these two things have in common? They're both written by her husband. <laughs> That was it. Both written by Marcel. One's free. The other you get on Amazon and pay for. But let me tell you something. Look at the bright side. If you have a question, you can go to the author and ask him. Take advantage of these. Both of these have to do with the gospel of John. You want to know the John? Life in the vineyard, 30 days, John 15. Walking with Jesus one year in the book of John 
and you can go to the author. That's a tremendous resource right there. Tremendous things just, just to help you know about Jesus. Continue. Next resource. How many remember Tony's book, The Essential Jesus? That was good. That'll help. You can share that with someone else. You can give it to them. You can go through it with them. Just getting to know Jesus. Next. Oh, already gave you that one. You, you've already got that, and you haven't paid me your $100 yet, but it's there. The offer is there. And finally, soul revolution. Some of you are going, oh, I know all those things. You know, every one of those will help you and help you help someone else begin this journey with getting to know Jesus, getting connected to him, and connected to others that are also following him. Why would this connect make church simple? Because it's built on two things. Number one, life on life. See, the key here is just somebody who wants to grow and somebody who wants to help someone grow. It's not based on a long program. It's not based on a whole... It, it means everybody here, if you want to grow, can grow. Everybody here, if you want to help someone, you can. It's right there. It's not dependent on someone else out there having the right book, having the time to do... No, no. It depends simply life on life. Some people are book learners. How many of you are book learners? God bless you. I'm glad. But notice you're the minority. So if discipleship were based all on books, the majority of people are in trouble. How many of you learn best just by talking through things with people? How many of you are that kind of people? Raise your hand. A few more. Okay. Yeah, let's, let's just, so, so we get together and we talk through things. We do that in life groups. How many of you go, I don't listen to, I don't read books and I don't listen to people. I just learn it the good old-fashioned way, hard knocks. How many raise your hand? Go. <laughs> Sucks to be you. Okay, that's, just, <laughs> that's a tough way to learn. <laughs> Effective, but tough. Now, let me give you a second reason it's simple. It's doing life together. Doing life together. I have watched our church. And we have done it. We've had a discipleship program. We've had different things that we've done along the way. And I have yet to find anything more effective than people being with people in small groups, learning to put into practice what God's Word has said to them.